So hi, uh, today we will talk about the uh, Salient Pole uh, synchronous missions. As you can remember from the early weeks, there are uh, two main types of uh, synchronous missions. One of them has a, a cylindrical rotor, which have a constant uh, air gap across, across the rotor uh, surface. And the other one has the uh, Salient Pole, so the air gap was uh, really small here, but it was it has a larger air gap on that portion so that uh, causes some inductance uh, variation and some reluctance uh, torque so again if you recall the early weeks so in a cylindrical rotor uh, machine so the only inductance variation we have is the mutual inductance between the rotor and the stator so you know that uh, mutual inductance is a function of the cosine some theta and when you take the derivative of that thing that becomes uh, sine uh, theta and later on uh, we call uh, that theta as the load angle so you know we have uh, the torque again is proportional to stator uh, current and also the rotor current because that creates the field and that creates the EF uh, component as we have seen in the equivalent circuit uh, last week uh, this is you know the cylindrical rotor and again, if you look at the salient rotor, uh, what we have on top of on top of that, you know, synchronous torque or the mutual uh, flux component, we have a variation of the inductance with respect to uh, stator windings. Okay, so even if you don't excite I two, even if you you know close the field winding in a normal uh, synchronous machine, if you don't have any field winding, that doesn't create any torque. But in a salient uh, rotor machine, even if you close that one, we have the reluctance torque component. So reluctance co torque component is not related with I2 at all, but it is with respect to change of the inductance, self-inductance, and uh, with respect to rotation. So actually, uh, salient pole machines use that property to create slightly larger uh, torque than synchronous machines. So let's see a couple of examples. So here you see a normal uh, cylindrical rotor machine. I don't know the application, but it's probably a high speed machine. So it has a small uh, diameter and a long axial, axial length. And again, you can see the, again, okay, there are some, you know, places uh, to put those uh, windings, but normally the surface is uh, quite uh, cylindrical. So the air gap doesn't change, so you don't have any inductance, any significant inductance variation with respect to position. And again, in permanent magnet motors, here you see, I mean here, this is the stator, obviously. So this is the rotor, and those black parts are the permanent magnets. Okay, or PM. Yeah. So in that one, we don't have a separate uh, field winding to generate some MMF, but we put uh, some permanent magnets. So the idea is more or less same. But again, if you look at that one, you know, the rotor itself, because the permeability of uh, rotor, let's say it is like infinite. Again, the relative permeability of uh, permanent magnet is really close to uh, permeability of air the self uh, permeability so again uh, the actual uh, gap in this case you know can be considered here and it is uh, symmetrical so again here we don't have any reluctance torque and let's see some examples of the uh, salient pole machines so here uh, you see a rotor okay so those are the windings of the rotor so this is the field winding which you excite with DC so all thing becomes an electromagnet and that magnet uh, starts rotating so from the you know mag electromagnetic points of view it doesn't really matter if you create that MMF using some electromagnet or if you use a permanent magnet and again from here you can see one two three again one another here so there is it's a four pole uh, four pole synchronous machine and again if you look at here so in that direction 
you have the minimum air gap but actually if you look at uh, that direction the air gap is uh, quite large and if the air gap changes then you have variable reluctance with respect to position and if you have variable reluctance then that changes the inductance as well so in that kind of machine you have both the synchronous torque and you have the reluctance torque reluctance torque can work together with the synchronous torque or in some cases we will see you know those things can oppose each other so one of them would like to go in one direction the other one can go in the other direction okay so again uh, let's have a look at example in a permanent magnet motor and actually we are not getting into design of electrical machines this is normally a graduate uh, course but i will show you some examples of the electric car motors so they are uh, quite commonly used in uh, electric uh, car motors because they require you know uh, quite high amount of torque from a small uh, volume so here on the left you see a surface mount permanent magnet smps a surface mount smpm machine and on the right so this is called ipm so interior permanent magnet machine and actually if you look at uh, the position you know it is quite uh, tilted and you know those things are again like one pole two pole three pole four pole this is a four pole machine this is also a four pole machine because these two magnets are oriented in the same direction but again you know you can think those orange areas like air for example from the magnetic point of view because the permeability of magnets are uh, much smaller than the permeability of iron so you know again you know there is some inductance change you know if if the flux would like to go in that direction it has to pass the air gap but it is maybe easier on the other side so there's some variation in the inductance and actually there are you know this is a simple example and let's see a more obvious example so again here this is a synchronous reluctance motor again the reluctance part is uh, quite dominant on that one so here you know you create some mmf from the magnets and for flux again all the, the other parts uh, those are iron parts here and the red areas are permanent magnets okay so for flux it is really easy to travel in that direction because if the flux is going across that direction it can all travel uh, through the iron which has a, a high permeability then it has to pass over that uh, tiny air gap then it can close its path like that but however if it would like to go in the other direction uh, let me use the red one or maybe not use the green arrow so if it would like to go along that direction okay so here it has to pass like larger air gap length so its reluctance is much higher that way that way and remember uh, inductance was uh, l was n square over r so as the reluctance increases your inductance reduces so you know again you know that kind of we are not getting into analysis of those things but I just want you to get some uh, familiarity with those uh, topologies uh, if you design you know that kind of rotor properly you know, it can uh, create quite a lot of uh, torque and actually car manufacturers uh, utilize uh, that function so here you see a really early version of the uh, Prius motor so from 2003 so it is again it is uh, uh, interior permanent magnet but its reluctance uh, and uh, difference is not that high then you know they from that straight alignment so they go to here on the next year and in 2010 you know they even increase that kind of salience and Ford machine has Ford motor has the same kind of uh, saliency Chevy Volts has that one Lexus Leaf and actually I have I think a few more so i don't know if you can let me try to zoom in a little bit so on the left uh, you see a bmw motor and again 
you know it is for flux it is is quite a you know high number of pole machines you can count the number of poles and here you can see it is really easy uh, for flux to travel you know through that direction but it is uh, difficult to go over that gap and the same for nissan and here we have a model uh, 3 so actually in tesla in the first generations uh, model s and uh, they used induction motor so the name tesla is coming from that induction machine but in the newer models actually they started using uh, permanent magnet synchronous machines and here you can see the permanent magnets okay and again for flux it is easy to travel in that direction but it is not uh, easy to go over that one so actually if you rotate that machine and if you just uh, if you just remove the permanent magnets okay if you just remove the permanent magnets so it is equivalent to having no field current in a normal synchronous machine normally the synchronous cylindrical synchronous machines uh, don't ro rotate with that kind of condition but as we have you know that kind of uh, saliency so that creates a reluctance torque and actually you can still uh, rotate the machine even without the permanent magnets and you put the permanent magnets and they, they generate the synchronous torque on top of the reluctance torque so you can get a uh, quite high amount of torque uh, from that motor okay so you know actually i i just want you to understand the general uh, topology and the physical uh, orientation of a salient pole machine so let's uh, uh, sorry there's another example so we have Renault Zoe so this has actually no permanent magnets as well at all so this is a uh, electrically excited or it has a field winding as you can see and actually that motor will be in your first uh, experiments and simulations so here again you can see it is one two three four pole uh, actually it has again you can see the saliency the air gap will be really small on that side and that side but it has a kind of a large air gap here so it has some uh, saliency as well so it's a salient pole uh, synchronous motor so anyway so uh, let's try to uh, define the phasers and the equivalent circuit parameters in a salient pole machine so what we know is now we don't have a single uh, inductance but we can have uh, two inductance definitions one of the place where the air gap is minimum and the other is for the place where the air gap is max so let's call those axes okay d axis and q axis d is uh, for direct axis okay and q is for quadrature axis and as the na name suggests so actually quadrature axis is uh, 90 degrees uh, apart from the d-axis and again you know the orientation of the q-axis can be different in some books or it can be different in the uh, generating mode or motoring mode but what you need to know is so where the air gap is minimum okay so it is that orientation here we call it d-axis and in the d-axis let me write here d-axis so it has minimum reluctance and at the q-axis okay q-axis they have the maximum reluctance maximum air gap so from here again you can remember l is equal to n square over r so you can say at the d-axis so inductance is max and here inductance is minimum again you know the variation of that uh, thing can be quite different but let's again assume you know that kind of definition uh, variation so it can be something like l theta and l q and where you know it is maximum uh, we call that place is ld and where it is minimum it can be defined as lq it doesn't have to be like perfect sinusoidal as in this case but uh, that shows 
when you take the derivative of the inductance with respect to rotation that has a non-zero component so that creates the reluctance torque and the, the axis is uh, the direct axis is d quadrature axis is q axis okay so again here it is shown here in the direct axis the flux would like to travel like that so it has to pass just over uh, that tiny air gap and it's quite exaggerated in this uh, figure normally it is just a couple of uh, millimeters and in the other side however if you would like to go through here then it has to pass through a larger uh, area and again uh, that that is for a two pole machine let me try to roll if you have a four pole structure like that for my drawing but anyway so in this case you will have the axis here okay and that will be again you know the axis that will be again the axis the axis and here in our case two axis uh, will be behind will matter so again you know when i say 90 degrees okay when i say 90 degrees uh, it is actually that 90 degrees is for two pole machine or actually if it is for uh, it is for electrical angle it is always 90 degrees for electrical angle but in mechanical angle in actual uh, position for example here again mechanically it is like uh, nine uh, mechanically it is like 45 degrees but electrically it still corresponds to uh, 90 degrees variation if you just rotate it one uh, electrical rotation anyway so let's uh, make our uh, definitions so we have in the d and q axis we can define the inductances when the rotor is aligned to that position so we have the inductance at d axis position which is called ld and we have the q axis inductance which is called lq okay and normally as we have uh, discussed here so ld inductance is larger than lq inductance and therefore uh, the axis uh, reactance is larger than uh, q axis reactance and normally you know xq is around 0 0.6 times 0 0.7 of uh, xd so in cylindrical machines however you know all those things were equal and we used to call it xs okay the stator reactance but now we have uh, two different inductances at two different uh, positions so the idea again i'm not getting into really derivation of that equivalent circuit uh, i will put some uh, reading materials if you are interested but let's uh, separate our ia into two components okay so we will have the id and iq okay so let me try to if you have some ia like that okay so that can be represented by two orthogonal uh, vectors okay so let's call one of them as id vector and the other one is iq so i'm separating armature current with the two orthogonal vectors and the condition is the id you know direct direct axis current will be in phase with our uh, flux okay so that is where uh, so that is where uh, in that direction so any current corresponding on that direction will create some mmf in the axis okay so and actually if we had some if we had some coils here right so they were creating mmf in the same direction so the other one quadrature axis component is perpendicular to phi f and again remember uh, the ef the induced voltage is proportional to derivative of flux uh, so there's like 90 degrees between each other so that is why in the you know 
in the quadrature axis current iq is now perpendicular to phi f and therefore it is in phase with if okay iq is in phase with ef so they are like uh, parallel vectors so i think it will be more clear once we get into the phaser diagram so i will do the uh, same uh, as we did before and uh, let's uh, try to draw a phaser diagram from scratch uh, for a salient pole machine in the in the generating mode okay so as usual uh, let me draw our uh, vt you don't have to start with that one maybe it is not connected to um, infinite pass but anyway uh, let's uh, do it from here so then uh, i have the uh, ia right i have the ia and in this case again it doesn't have to operate in this case but now it is operating at uh, lagging power factor right so then again i'm not going to draw it yet but R E F so it is generating mode so this is R E F I don't know the magnitude yet and again this is our load angle right so what I do what I do I divide my current into two components okay let's go back and one of them is in phase with ef so iq is will be in phase with ef and id will be 90 degrees with that one or it will be in phase with uh, flux so in other words uh, that is you know you can define let me use a different color so that is our uh, quadrature axis you can call that axis two axis okay and that one is the axis okay so it is 90 degrees this is you know by definition so what i do is i divide that current component into two components one of them is iq the other one is i d okay so they are 90 degrees and again i can write i a is i d plus i q so it's just you know mathematical trick of course i am not uh, dividing the current into two components but you know mathematically i can divide it uh, definition uh, i can uh, divide it into two factors like that so normally what i do is i can you know in the cylindrical pole machine i have that ia and i am multiplying with uh, j excess and i find the ef but now i don't have excess okay so my excess now divided into like xd and xq components so actually i'm going to multiply it the again if you just go back so xd is actually larger than xq so i'm going to multiply id with xd and i'm going to multiply iq with xq okay so if i multiply id okay so it is perpendicular over here if i multiply id with j let me write those things yeah sorry we have j excess previously now they become jxd and jxq so now i am multiplying jxd with uh, sorry id with uh, jxd so it was normally you know behind ef line or q axis line 90 degrees and once i multiply it now it becomes a um, parallel right it becomes parallel So this one is 
j xd times id vector so this is in parallel with q axis and therefore q axis definition is r ef vector direction right so then i have iq and i'm multiplying with j xq okay so it becomes rotated 90 degrees so it comes to here so this one is now j xq iq vector so they are still 90 degrees and actually if xd and xq are equal to each other and if they were excess you can still you know get those things and it will be a you know normal uh, triangle so you will have the same vector but now our x day is larger than xq so that triangle is now kind of distorted xd is larger okay so now i have let me write it here ef this is for a generating case so ef vector or let me write it here so ef vector is equal to vt plus okay uh, j xd id plus j xs oops, sorry xq i q okay and i have ia is equal to id iq so let me draw the ef vector at last so this will be my this will be my ef yeah right so we will uh, discuss you know the meaning of that uh, phaser diagram in a minute so again here now you can see similar things so we have a load angle delta and ef is leading vt because we drove it in generating mode and iq plus id is equal to ia so i just divided it into two components and multiplied it xd and xq so actually you can draw the same thing uh, for a motoring case in the motoring case again uh, it is no different from the cylindrical pole machine again uh, i mean this one is shown with is it doesn't really matter ia is still id vector plus iq vector and vt in this case is equal to ef plus j xd id plus j xs oh, make the same mistake iq xq here we have ef and this is our is and now it is being divided into two components I, iq is in phase with ef and id is uh, 90 degrees behind that one so then you have that 90 degrees vector and you multiply it with j so it becomes in phase with ef so here iq is in phase with ef but then you multiply it with j so it becomes 90 degrees rotated so that one that one and you have the vs and here vs is pulling ef so vs is ahead of ef because now it is working in the motoring mode right so the key points okay so let's have a look at that one so ef in the previous case remember ef was you know, again can be just that one or that one so in the previous case you know we can just uh, define that one and you know vt uh, post uh, delta will be equal to uh, ef right uh, but now actually if we have a higher id if we have higher id so that is the same effect as increasing ef so id id has the same effect as increasing ef so it is as if you have a field 
cut it okay so let me go here so ef magnitude wise is equal to vt cos delta plus xd id so id has some effect on ef magnitude so in the previous case the only way to in this uh, let me write it here so it is cylindrical cylindrical uh, synchronous machines so you can say ef was just purely with if the field current which you know can be written like that and or here like we have the id so even if you don't apply any field current you can generate some ef with that effect so that is the main you know idea about uh, generating some torque even if there is no field current okay so the other one is uh, let's have a look at here okay so that one vt sine delta so that distance vt sine delta is equal to x key iq so vt sine delta is equal to xq iq so iq if vt is constant okay if i mean xq is already constant the machine parameter so somehow if i increase iq component that will cause increased load angle and we already know that load angle is proportional with torque okay so if you increase if you can control iq separately you can control torque and by controlling id actually you can control the magnitude of ef or it's as if you are changing the field winding so suddenly your uh, stator current has two components one of them is like it is creating flux or it is weakening the flux so you can have some control over the field winding and the other one has some control over the torque so that is why for example in a permanent magnet machine okay in a permanent magnet machine there is no if or it is as if you have constant if right so there is no point i would like to put the machine in the lagging power factor or leading power factor by changing the field winding because in a permanent magnet machine there is no field winding machine so if you use a salient pole machine even if you don't have any field current because of the permanent magnet by adjusting the angle of the armature current actually you can adjust those quadrature axis and direct axis again those are you know outside the scope of this course if you choose the uh, power electronics area in the fourth year uh, you will see those things in 462 uh, course but the idea is you know by changing the magnitudes of id and iq separately you can control the field and torque components uh, separately so that is uh, quite important again uh, you know this is the same thing uh, what happens with the resistance so here we have the resistance component so here again it is drawn like ef was the zero angle component but it doesn't really matter you can rotate everything slightly in the counterclockwise direction so we have VA, so there's some uh, slight lagging power factor, and IA now is divided into two components again. So that one is that one written. So there is no point, you know, there's no point dividing the current for the resistance IA RA component because you know there is no changing of the resistance with, re with respect to rotor position, it's always the same. And there is no j component there is no you know derivative component so actually i a r a voltage drop component is like that one is in parallel with that one right so you can just uh, calculate the voltage drop then you can calculate the i d j i d x d component then j i q x q component and it is the same and again as you can see here and normally that resistance component is is quite uh, small so in some models we just uh, ignore it uh, completely okay so now uh, let's try to write some mathematical relations okay so in that you know figure again with array usually it's not that important 
but actually you can divide that thing into you know two components so let's say you want to find the magnitude of ef so magnitude of ef is what is that so i would like to find from here to that distance so it is va cos delta vt cos delta so it is that component so then we have let me try to draw uh, the zoomed version here so here it is ia ra component again you don't have to uh, divide it into two components but mathematically okay it is the same as writing these two phasers one of them is iq ra component one of them is id ra component so if you are trying to find the in this case the horizontal axis component okay so that gap over here so that is iq array okay so let me write here as well so that one is from here to here it is vt cos delta and here id so this is the magnitude okay vt cos delta xd id ra iq okay and again similarly you can find you know, those components so that one becomes vt or va uh, sine delta and then there is no you know id component uh, iq component on that one and the vertical component of the resistance drop is id ra here to there so it can be written ia rd and that one is you know from the mathematical point of view so that one is equal to iq xq right so these are you know two equations with ra again i'm going to omit uh, ra so you can just you know omit arrays and you can uh, obtain you know these two terms we already derived so ef magnitude is vt cos delta xt id and vt sine delta is equal to xq iq right so let's uh, try to derive the power equation okay so first uh, let's start with the three is for three phase vt is terminal voltage ia is normal and cos theta is our power factor so at the end of day you have a machine so you have three cables coming in so you have vt phase and phase currents getting out and then you have the power factor so that is your normal uh, power definition electrical power definition so how can i write okay ia so i have it here okay so how can you write ia cos theta so let's go back here in our schematic so i would like to draw that component let me copy that one I have the same uh, figure here so i would like to find that distance let me use a different color i would like to oh, like to find that distance because that distance is ia cos theta so in order to find that actually i can write you know the real components here what is that the first one or let me draw it a bigger one right it will be easier so this is ia right this is q this is i sorry this id this was iq
So this is theta. This is load angle delta. This is like so this is ID. Right. So I would like to find that distance over here because that distance is I A cos theta, right? And I can get the first component. So the first component, let's use it with yellow. So that part is equal to I Q cos delta. Okay. And the other component, actually, this is the same as I D. Okay. So this one is not that obvious. I would like to find uh, that distance. Okay. That distance is actually, you know, that distance. And, you know, you can start from uh, trigonometry. So that is 90 degrees delta, 90 minus delta, 90 minus delta. So you can show uh, that one is delta. So that orange part, okay, that orange part becomes ID times sine delta. So I can write IA cos theta, write it here, IA cos theta, which is, that is equal to, start with IQ, IQ cos uh, delta plus ID sine, right? So that is how we, you know, get, go from that distance, uh, that uh, definition to that definition. So then instead of IA cos theta, I can write, you know, that equation. Then uh, I need to use, okay, instead of those things, I will write everything again in, in terms of VT and EF. So let's use the relation VT sine delta is equal to XQ, XQ IQ. And where does it come from? So VT, I mean, uh, direction wise, uh, VT sine delta, let me write it here. That one is here. Okay, that one is equal to VT sine delta. Right? So it is equal to XQ, XQ. So then instead of IQ, I can write VT sine delta divided by XQ, right? Then I know VT cos delta, let me go here again, VT cos delta is here, but is that one EF minus XDID, so this is EF minus the orange pet so you come to here it is equal to vs uh, cos delta so instead of uh, vs cos delta i can write ef xdid all those things are magnitude wise we don't have vectors anymore we are talking about the uh, scalar magnitudes okay so we have vt cos delta so instead of using that equation i can draw uh, id so it is EF minus VT cos theta divided by XD. So I have the definitions of IQ and ID in terms of terminal and EF voltages. So the only thing that I need to do now, so we have written that equation. So I'm going to put everything together. Instead of ID, I'm going to write that equation. I'm going to write that equation. Instead of IQ, I'm going to write the other equation right so let's uh, do that so power okay is equal to three is coming from the uh, three phase and in the the previous one we have vt id uh, sine delta right so i'm going to write vt is already here instead of id i'm going to write ef minus vt cos 
delta divided by xd times there was another id sign delta term term plus then i have again vt 3vt times iq cos delta okay i have vt or you can take the vt to the outside uh, times instead of uh, iq i'm going to write that one vt sine delta divided by xq times cosine delta right so that equation uh, may seem quite complex but we will we will uh, simplify it in a minute i just i just make it uh, smaller to have some uh, space so then i will use uh, you know some uh, trigonometric uh, equation here so what is it we have like uh, let me write here uh, we have sine a plus b what is sine a plus e equals to sine a sine b okay plus cosine a cosine b right so or actually if a is equal to b but we know is sine 2a is equal to 2 sine a times cosine b right so i'm going to use that equation because i have sine you know cosine term and sine uh, cosine terms uh, quite a lot there okay i took uh, those equations to here so i will use you know that equation at first uh, let's try to write them in the long form so we have you know three and it is vt ef times sine delta vt ef sine delta divided by xd so that is you know similar to what we have from the uh, cylindrical rotor equations right so then vt minus vt cos theta sine theta so it becomes minus vt square times uh, cos theta i sorry cos delta sine delta divided by xd okay then i have here another vt square sine delta cos delta term divided by xq so now instead of you know using that equation instead of uh, sine delta cos delta term what i can write here is sine 2 delta divided by 2 right so then i would like to have those things i can multiply that one with xq and i can multiply it with xd so let's try to write that one 3 like vt ef sine delta divided by xd okay let's write the positive one first so and we have vt squares in both of them vt uh, times xd coming from here we have uh, times sine 2 delta divided by 2 term here and in the here we will have xd and xq let's do that one so you multiply that one the same thing so xq times you know cosine delta sine delta it is here there's an, another minus here it becomes minus xq xd minus xq so that is a really you know important equation so let's have a look at you know again you know we are not really responsible for derivation of that thing but i want you to have a look at that one and try to understand what it means so first of all 
so this was exactly the same component or let me write that one if okay so if xd was equal to xq that one is equal to xs which is the cylindrical rotor right so we will get rid of all that component and this will be 3 vtef sine delta divided by xs so that is the same component that we have with the cylindrical rotor so we call that component the synchronous power okay we can write the torque component by dividing to uh, by dividing it to rotational speed as well right so that is the synchronous power the second one actually you know it is working with difference of xd and xq and which was uh, was larger remember the in the d-axis reluctance was small so inductance was high so xd was uh, larger than xq so xd is larger than xq we have the salient pole So we have that component and that component has no ef component so remember ef was proportional with the field current but here in even if there is no field current in the synchronous machine and in the uh, cylindrical rotor synchronous machine we wouldn't have any power but in that one you know just applying some terminal voltage will be enough to generate some uh, power and torque if xd and xq are different and other important part is you know that one is proportional with two delta it was proportional with two delta and actually if you remember in the early weeks we saw an example let's call this is our uh, salient pole motor you know forget about the synchronous machine it is just you have some coils here and it can generate some torque so it was trying to align itself to the minimum reluctance position so it was creating like no torque at that position or at 90 degrees actually it was generating no torque component and actually if you define the inductance of that you know bottle or that rotor it was not something it was not like the mutual inductance it was not uh, proportional with delta or theta but it was proportional with twice of the delta because it has a two-way symmetry it doesn't really matter if you have here or there so if you make one rotation the reluctance term was actually making two rotations so remember in the early weeks we saw uh, that example and the torque component coming from the reluctance term was proportional with the two theta terms so that is why it was creating the maximum torque at 45 degrees remember so what happens to that term when you put 25 degrees and actually that creates the maximum torque at 25 degrees uh, load angle okay so that is the same as the reluctance power or torque that we derived in the early weeks okay and that component is there even if you don't uh, excite with ef and the mutual inductance term is proportional with theta or let me go back uh, so here so it was you know proportional with theta but in that one actually that inductance were, were proportional if you take the inductance function it was a function of two theta and you have the same equation here okay so the we call it the reluctance power and actually the first term it is the same with the cylindrical machine so this is kind of more generalized term and if you take xd is equal to xq that term was cancelling out and the second term it is the reluctance power and it is independent of ef so that it exists even if i am so what does that power or again if you divide everything by rotational speed you find the torque so because all oh, they are rotating with the synchronous speed so if you have a look at that one so the first sinusoidal that we have here so it is that one and this is the 
synchronous power so it is sinusoid and we have the maximum torque at 90 degrees remember this was the maximum power or maximum torque power uh, torque point uh, plot torque so on so on so on top of that we have that get rid of me we have that reluctance power component and that one is proportional with two delta and because of that actually it makes maximum value at 45 degrees this is all electrical Don't forget so 45 so at 90 degrees actually this one generating no torque so that means uh, if you have again that bottle and if you put at 90 degrees it is you know balanced so it doesn't rotate anyway it's kind of you know unstable but again you know it generates zero torque so that position corresponds to that point in in this graph okay so that's the important thing is from zero to 90 degrees so you generate some kind of extra torque so that is the extra torque that you cannot uh, extra power or that you cannot have with the synchronous machine so basically your synchronous machine if it were just cylindrical rotor it is going to have that kind of torque but now it generates more torque okay so and actually you can see previously the maximum power or maximum torque point was here but now it is increased up to that point increase in p okay so you have that extra region that you can generate more power and again the torque graph let me write here you know torque is equal p divided by synchronous speed so it is exactly the same uh, graph for the torque and actually that is why you know electric car manufacturers like the reluctance uh, torque that much because if it designed properly you know it can generate uh, more torque from the same volume of your motor so that means you know when you are advertising your electric car you can say it goes from 0 to 100 kilometers at 2.9 seconds whatever okay so this is you know that kind of thing however again you know it is uh, that's the good part but however if you are you know working across that point okay if you are working across that point or you know again if you just move back from here depending on which uh, kind of quadrant you have then even if your synchronous machine or synchronous power generates some positive component your reluctance component can be negative so that is you know fighting against each other so you don't want to run your machine at those regions anyway so you want to rotate across these regions and actually you get the maximum reluctance torque across here so you have the maximum benefit at 45 degrees or probably you will be running your machine here in the normal time but if you want to have some extra torque you can you know operate it along those points okay so that is all uh, for salient pole machines and i will solve an example in the rest station okay thank you